Chapter 6 Spider webs of cracks crisscrossed over the windshield of the bus, taking Jaime and Angela from Tapachula north to Ariaga. The engine rattled and groaned like every wheel rotation caused it great pain. Every dark-tinted window was wide open, and still, in, still the air in the bus was hot, humid, and stuffy, no different from the buses back home. Outside, the lush jungle foliage seemed to take over the landscape, including an abandoned immigration checkpoint. After a best-out-of-three battle of rock-paper-scissors, Angela got the cooler window seat but promised to change places halfway through the five-hour ride. Jaime didn't grumble. From the aisle seat, he had better access to unsuspecting subjects. The church visit had inspired him, and he was determined to capture in his sketchbook as much of his journey as possible. It was the only way to make the trip bearable and to forget why they had to take it. Jaime turned to a fresh sheet in his fat sketchbook. If he used both sides of the pages, he had about 80 free pages left. Plenty. An anchor to hold his sketchbook steady in the lurching bus Bus would be nice, but every great artist had to learn to draw in less than ideal situations. His first models were obvious. A young white tourist couple sitting up front, their overstuffed camping backpacks wedged between their legs. Jaime couldn't stop staring at the man's hair, orangey red like the memory of the setting sun he and Tomas had shared. Jaime had never seen hair quite that alarming and was sure it had to be dyed. Except the longer he stared at it and noticed the freckles on the back of the man's neck and the fine golden red hair of his arms, the more convinced Jaime was that the color was real. If only he had his paints with him. He would have loved to try and match the exact shade. Instead, he settled on switching his colored pencils between press, pressing lightly with the red and a bit harder with the orange. Not perfect. Hitting a pothole in the road gave the man a piercing on his neck, but the color wasn't too far off. He skipped the teenager playing on his phone, a great artist only chooses subjects of interest, and drew the family with three small children, freezing time with the moment the little girl popped the discovered gum from under her seat into her mouth. He was about to start on the four chickens, two white with black specks, one red, and one with plumas, so black they looked blue, crammed into a wire cage diagonally from him. When he felt a tap on his shoulder... The small elderly woman behind him in a white embroidered linen dress motioned to herself repeatedly as she babbled in Mayan with an occasional Spanish word thrown in. Claro que si. Jaime agreed with a grin as he turned around in his seat to face her. Although he didn't speak much Mayan and couldn't have translated her words, he understood what the little old lady wanted. He sharpened the brown pencil as the viejita smoothed down her silver hair wrapped in a bun. Friends and family sometimes asked Jaime to draw their portraits. Miguel had begged for one of himself, dressed as Superman, and his little cousins especially loved being immortalized as cartoon caricatures. But this was his first time drawing for a stranger. What if she didn't like it? What if he made her look ugly? Angela, turning away from the window where she'd been reading the name of every village they passed by, nodded encouragement. The bus bumped up and down as it trekked north, but Jaime rested the sketchbook steadily, on the backrest as he shaded her diminutive features. He smoothed out her wrinkles and captured the brightness in her eyes. The hand-stitched embroidery surrounding the collar of the dress seemed to almost jump off the page. In ten minutes, he finished and tilted the book for her approval. She squealed with delight, placing a wrinkled hand on his cheek, but then pointed to the empty bottom right-hand corner, waving her fingers as if she were holding a pen. Jaime remembered what his fourth-grade teacher had said when they had studied Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa. The famous painting is unsigned, but at least we know Leonardo painted it. If not, it would be virtually worthless. Not that his art was worth anything, but it was fun to pretend it would be. He switched from the colored pencils to the lead one and wrote his full name in a lavish scribble, Jaime Antonio Rivera Munoz. Slowly, carefully, he tore out the page from his book. He picked at the raw edge to remove the scraggly bits of paper. It was worth it to see the viejita's skin crinkle into a smile and to hear her utter words of gratitude he didn't specifically understand as her spotted hands clutched the portrait to her heart. At the next village, she once again nudged his shoulder. She stood, barely a meter and a half tall, with her fist outstretched. Jaime shook his head. No es necesario. See, si, she said, with such insistence, it would have been rude for Jaime to disobey. He held out his hand, and three coins tumbled into it. Gracias. He beamed at her as she waved her hands over him in a blessing, and shuffled off the bus, one hand laden with her shopping bags and a cane, the other cradling his drawings as if it were a treasure. 
Angela, who had alternated between looking out the window and watching the transaction, nudged him in the ribs. How much did you get? Jaime turned over the heavier gold and silver coin and then the two bronze ones to read their value, 12 pesos. Look at you, Diego Rivera, Angela teased. You keep this up and you can fly us to Tomas on an airplane. Jaime rolled his eyes but was secretly pleased. It wasn't too hard imagining he was related to the famous Mexican painter. After all, they shared a last name. But to some day be known around the world for his paintings like Diego Rivera, he couldn't imagine how great that would be. He did the peso Quetzal conversion quickly in his head. If he was right, 12 pesos would only buy him a drink. And if he was lucky, a cookie. Didn't matter how little 12 pesos translated to be. He was now officially a professional artist. Nothing could take that away from him. There were no villages around when two men appeared from the bushes and flagged down the bus. Their clothes were dirty and torn, as were their faces. One had crusted blood from a gash on his forehead, while the other's bottom lip hung like a wet sock on the washing line. They gave each other the driver, gave the driver a coin and hovered near the front instead of going the length of the bus and sitting down. About 10 kilometers later, the bus driver pulled over again to the side of the road. A truck zoomed by with a whoosh that made it feel like the bus would tip over. The battered men thanked the driver and disappeared back into the bushes. A few minutes later, a few minutes after that, the brakes squeaked and protested as the bus slowed down again. Through the open window, Jaime saw no village, no buildings anywhere in sight, just lush trees, overgrown bushes, and long grasses all squeezed together, fighting against one another for their right to live on a bit of earth. Everyone on the bus shifted to look out the cracked windshield where lights flashed their warning. Something was wrong. A hush whisper vibrated through the bus. La Migra. Orange cones blocking the road forced the bus to come to a complete stop. Only one guard was on duty, but a rifle hung from his shoulder, ready to be snapped into his hands the second he needed it. Jaime clenched his pencil tightly. The guard leaned in the bus, hands on the open door jam to peer inside. Jaime jerked away before they could make eye contact and felt his face burn with self-indignation. So obvious, so guilty. The guard was sure to know he didn't belong in Mexico, but the guard just turned back to the driver. Anyone new gotten on? Anyone I need to know about? The driver shook his head. No. It was mostly true. After all, the men they'd picked up in the middle of nowhere weren't on the bus anymore. They must have known about the stop and how to avoid it. Clever. And at the same time, risky. The bus driver could have easily mentioned where he dropped them off. Drivers back home would have if they thought they'd get paid for the information. Instead, this driver seemed content in minding his own business and doing his, oh, doing only his bus driver job. The guard returned his gaze outside, taking in the six cars, waiting behind the bus, then moved a few cones out of the way and waved them by without asking any further questions. No one was on duty at the next checkpoint, a tiny wooden structure on the side of the road, and it was only because Angela read the sign announcing it that Jaime even realized what it was. He let out a deep breath. Maybe there was nothing to worry about. Maybe the stories he'd heard, stories of how La Migra beat you up, sent you to prison, and then returned you to your country in pieces. If you were lucky, were just stories. Tales told to prevent people from attempting the journey. Except he didn't really believe they were made up, especially when they arrived at the next checkpoint. A large building stood alone in the middle of the jungle. Concrete and steel with spotless white paint, just its presence radiated a sense of foreboding against the lush green. Ten cars waited in front of them, and many more beeped their horns behind them. Loads of guards milled around, their rifles ready in their hands. On the window seat next to him, Jaime felt more than Jaime felt more than heard Angela utter a prayer. He could feel her fear. Jaime sent a prayer of his own. This one to Miguel. Please help keep us safe. As far as they had traveled, they were still only in Chiapas, the most southern state in Mexico. They were going to need a lot of help. Sweat dripped down their faces as they waited in the sweltering bus for permission to continue. The driver opened the door, but no breeze entered, and no one dared exit. It felt like hours before a guard stomped on with thundering steps. He didn't have a rifle, but his hand was wrapped tight around the leash of a dog. Angela tried to wedge herself between the seat and the window. Jaime seized her hand, both for comfort and to keep her from doing something stupid. With her pathological fear of dogs... He wouldn't be surprised if she was tempted to jump out the window and risk the, her chances against the armed guards. The dog, though, was small and looked like Snoopy with floppy ears framing its cute face. His black nose twitched as he investigated the front crevices of the bus. Don't worry, 
Jaime whispered so low he hoped Angela heard. He's just a sniffer. He won't hurt us. Except dogs smell fear. And Angela was practically oozing it. A sudden dread overcame Jaime. Maybe this was a new thing, training dogs to smell fear in people so the guards could weed out the foreigners. No, he thought. Taking a deep breath and letting it out slowly, there was nothing to worry about. Unlike Angela, who still had the teeth marks on her leg from where she'd been bitten as a little girl, he liked dogs, and this one wasn't intimidating, especially if he imagined the dog sitting on top of his doghouse wearing an old-fashioned fighter pilot cap. After giving the driver a quick sniff, the dog started whining at the tourist couple up front. Abran las bolsas, the guard said, pointing to their backpacks. The orange-haired guy said something in an unfamiliar language, but then opened his backpack. The guard riffled through and quickly came up with a little plastic bag holding what looked like dried herbs. Orange-haired guy tried to explain in his foreign language, but the guard didn't care. He looked out the window, checked the location of the other guards, and pocketed the bag before moving the dog on. The dog trotted down the aisle, panting in the stuffy bus, wagging his tail and poking his nose in everyone's luggage. Through his brown, black, and white coat, Jaime counted his ribs. When the dog got to them, Angela squeezed Jaime's hand extra tight. She kept shifting her gaze between the dog's open mouth and the open window. Jaime squeezed her hand back. Maybe it was Jaime's imagination, but the dog seemed to take an extra long time checking out their food bag. They'd spent the day in Tapachula, and while they'd kept their things with them the whole time, was there any chance someone might have slipped something incriminating into their bags? Were he and Angela mules, transporting illegal drugs without knowing it? That had happened to Marcella's brother, and he had spent months in Mexican prison. Or maybe the dogs liked sniffing good food. Whether due to bravery or poor judgment, Jaime offered the dog a sniff of his free hand. No lo toques! The guard jerked the dog away to the next people, but not before Jaime felt the softest lick on his palm. In the back of the bus, the dog began barking like crazy. Angela cowered and held Jaime's hand to her chest. But Jaime, along with everyone else on the bus, glanced quickly to see what was happening. Two men were sitting on the bench in the back of the bus, their hands resting on two black duffel bags. Jaime couldn't remember if they had only been on the bus at Tapachula or had gotten on elsewhere. He couldn't remember them at all. They weren't loud. Their faces could have blended into any other face on the bus, except the tourists up front. And their jeans and t-shirts were what everyone wore. If Jaime had to remember all the people on the bus, those two would have been left out. Maybe that was their job to be forgettable. Except now, with the dog barking like crazy, no one would forget about them. The men, however, didn't even flinch. The one on the left, whose dark eyebrows joined above his nose, reached into his pocket and then held out his hand. The dog handler shifted to shake the man's hand and in an instant put his hand into his own pocket. It was impossible to see what happened unless you knew, and everyone on the bus knew. These two unrecognizable men had just bribed the guard to keep his mouth and the dog shut. Cayete! The officer ordered the dog to shut up and gave him a sharp jerk on the lead. The dog obeyed, but kept staring at the men's bags. The guard turned to leave and had to yank the reluctant dog several times. The dog didn't seem to understand why he was being punished for doing his job right. Pobrecito, Jaime said once the dog and his corrupt handler had left. What do you mean, poor thing? He almost attacked us. Angela let go of her cousin's hand and wiped her palms on her jeans. Outside, the dog was being yanked to the next vehicle, his cafe-colored eyes fixated on the bus like the bone that got away. He just wanted a friend, someone to give him chorizo and believe him when, shh, Angela pretended to stretch so she could glance at the non-memorable memorable men in the back of the bus. When she straightened back up in the hard seat, she glared at him. Nothing happened in here. The dog came in and left. That's it. Jaime's lips pressed and scrunched. Pero, no, but... Angela grabbed his shirt to bring his ear close to her mouth. Think about it. Remember the alphas? What people with that kind of money, that kind of power can do if they think you'll give them trouble? Nothing happened. Jaime grumbled as he pulled on his shirt out of her grasp, but then nodded. He turned to a new page in his sketchbook. In a corner, a brown, black, and white Snoopy dog appeared, his teeth gleaming in a smile as his tongue retrieved a bit of chorizo, clinging to the strap of his fighter pilot cap. Involved in his drawing, Jaime barely noticed that the bus still hadn't moved until Angela nudged him. Change places with me. Rapido. Angela muttered, already climbing over him. Jaime paused in mid-doghouse sketch and slid over to the window seat without questioning her. Moments later, another immigration officer stomped up the steps into the bus, a rifle slung over his broad shoulders. 
He ignored the tourist couple as if they weren't even there and asked the teen who had been playing on his phone where he came from. A coxman just outside Tapachula, the teen said, poor you, the guards snickered as if there were things worse than being from a coxman. The teen shrugged, but the guard had already moved on to speak to the family with three young children. Ninos, tell me where you're going. But the children, the eldest no more than five years old, stared at him with wide eyes. The girl, the middle child, still chewed the gum she'd found under the seat. The guard waited and said nothing. Finally, he turned to their parents. Son Mexicanos, see. Si. The papa pulled out some documents from his back pocket and smoothed them out for the guard. La Migra looked through them and grunted before handing them back and moving on. He chatted a bit with the lady with the caged chickens, asking what she was cooking and teasing or threatening that he'd stop by for stop by for dinner. Two seats from Jaime and Angela, a young woman, was also asked where she came from. Por favor, she pleaded. I come from Chiapas. Jaime sneaked a glance at Angela, and she confirmed his suspicion with the slightest shake of her head. Judging by the woman's accent, Jaime would have guessed she came from El Salvador. The fact that she twitched almost uncontrollably, shifting her head as if she were looking for a hiding place, didn't make her lie more convincing. The guard seemed to guess the same thing. He crossed his arms over his chest and stood with his feet shoulder-width apart. Chiapas, do you have proof? You sound Central American to me. From his seat, Jaime noticed the back of her brown neck reddening, and she cleared her throat. No, no, I have allergies. My throat. It always happens in the spring. His patience gone, the guard pointed his rifle at her and barked, Get off the bus! We're sending you back to Guatemala. But I'm not Guatemalan, the woman insisted, no longer lying. Who cares? You can return to your country from there. Please, you don't understand, the woman cried and pleaded. I must get to Texas. My husband, he beats me. My children, they have nothing to eat. Please, in God's name, the woman clutched a lumpy plastic bag to her chest, as if it would shield and protect her. It didn't. The guard grabbed her and dragged her off the bus, pushing her toward a guard waiting outside. The man whacked her across the head with his arm. She crumpled to the dirt, blood oozing from the side of her head, where the guard's watch had caught her. Not that he noticed or cared. A sharp nudge in her stomach from his rifle, and the Salvadoran woman was back on her feet. For a second, she looked like she would bolt, but the outside guard took hold of her arm and twisted it behind her back until she had no choice but to follow. Her screams echoed across the jungle until she was flung into one of several windowless white vans, waiting a few meters away. The bus driver did nothing. His job was only to drive the bus and collect the fare. If this was his regular route, he probably saw this happen every day. It took every clenching muscle in Jaime's body to keep from wetting himself. In a few minutes, that could be he, him and Angela too. Keep drawing, keep drawing, Angela muttered. As the gringa Taurus gasped and seized hold of her partner's freckled arm, Jaime stared at his sketchbook as if he'd never seen it before. Draw? How could he draw at a time like this when he'd just seen a woman literally thrown out of the bus? But Angela was right. He had to pretend he had nothing to be scared of. As if he belonged. As if he were Mexicano. Hand shaking a second time within the bus ride, he began doodling next to Snoopy. Before he realized what he'd drawn, the bat signal appeared at the top of the page. The sign that someone in Gotham, C Gotham City needed Batman's help. Great. No hidden symbolism there. Could his sketch be more obvious? Still, he didn't erase it. it. Just continued with the next doodle. By the time their guard was back on the bus and at their side... Jaime's page not only had Snoopy and the bat signal, but the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Mickey Mouse scattered around. Half the kids at school had similar doodles in their notebooks. Hopefully the guard had kids. Are you two together? The guard asked. His breath reeked of coffee and too many cigarettes. Jaime glanced at him briefly before returning to shaping Yoda's ears just right. Keep calm and blend in. Yup, Angela said, with more assurance than Jaime felt. As she continued, he couldn't help but notice her accent had changed. She was putting less emphasis on the last vowels of her words, making her tone more neutral. Abuela needs help for a few days. It's getting hard for her to roll out the tortillas. The beauty about that lie was that it really wasn't a lie. Their grandmother was struggling with the tortillas and always welcomed any help. Jaime doubted those lie detectors they showed in movies could have picked out the deception. After all, it wasn't as if the guard had actually asked where they were going. You're not from Chiapas, are you? Veracruz. Angela named a different Mexican state without hesitating, but a state not exactly where the bus was heading, nor where it came from. The lie detector in Jaime's head had flashed, head flashed warnings like the lights on the guard's car outside. If Angela realized her mistake, she didn't show it. Ah, Estado Ayi? Have you been there? It's beautiful. 
Again, Jaime noticed the difference in her accent, particularly her verb choice. In Guatemala, they would have said, Aves, estado ahí? Good call, Angela, and thank you, Mexican TV shows. The guard caught the verb use, and at the sound of it, gave them a slight nod of approval. Just as Jaime was about to relax, the guard reached over Angela and poked him in the shoulder, causing the pencil to slip and streak, giving Yoda a double-ended lightsaber. What about you, boy? Do you like helping your abuela make tortillas? Sometimes, Jaime said with a shrug, even though his brain had gone into panic mode. He didn't know if he could imitate a Mexican accent and remember to use the verb forms they did. He stuck with what he did know, sketching and doodling. What you got there? The guard grabbed the notebook out of his hands and began thumbing through it. Jaime swallowed a gasp. His book. How dare this guy take it? His grubby hands leaving prints on the fresh sheets. It took all the restraint he had to keep from grabbing it back. On the floor, blocked from view by their bags, his cousin dug her heel into his foot. Her message couldn't have been clearer. Don't you dare do anything stupid. The anger turned to fear as he tried to remember what he'd drawn and whether there were anything that would obviously link to Guatemala. He mentally flipped through the pages in reverse order. The people on the bus, the statue of Benito Juarez, the church, then recollections of his last time last week at home, Rosita playing with Cuico, Tio and Tia outside in the patio, Abuela struggling with her t- tortillas, Mama taking a siesta, Papa sticking his tongue out at him, Laura, the pretty girl at school he never got the nerve to talk to, and now it was too late. Miguel's funeral. The sound of ripping paper returned him to the stopped bus. Bits of paper clung to the rings from where La Migra officer had torn a page. Angela's foot pressed against his, a reminder not to freak out, a page, only one. Jaime allowed himself the smallest breath. My son likes lizards. He always saves them from the cat. The officer waved the drawing Jaime had done when he had gotten the news about Miguel. The book thumped back onto his lap. One hand flapping the lizard portrait to fan himself from the stuffy bus air, the other resting on his rifle. The guard moved down the aisle to question the next people. Too soon to breathe properly, Jaime held the sketchbook tight in his lap. It felt like a different book, worn and more pliable, the cover not as crisp as it had been. He could live with this different, violated feeling, he supposed, just as long as he never lost the book completely. It was his life, or what remained of it. Five minutes later, the guard left the bus. No cars blocked their way anymore, and a different guard waved them off. Heavy sighs of relief escaped everyone, from the bus driver to the youngest in the family of children. As they passed the windowless white van, everyone turned to stare at it, and then at the empty seat that a few minutes before had held a woman searching for a better life.